Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video episode on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction House taking a look at some of the guns they have coming up for sale in their April 2015 premiere auction. And there's a really cool one here that appealed to me because it is both an unusual gun, it's an unusual mechanism, it's from a somewhat underappreciated designer, and it's Japanese, and I kind of really like Japanese pre-war and World War II designs. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. What we have specifically is a Japanese copy of a Pedersen self-loading rifle. Now these are probably a little more familiar to people in their other guys. This is an example of a Pedersen that was built by the Vickers company in England. And this, a gun very similar to this, was actually tested by the US military and was the prime competitor against the M1 Garand. Of course the M1 was ultimately chosen. And after the Pedersen rifle in US trials lost out to the M1, John Pedersen took his design to England and uh, where he worked up a, an agreement with the Vickers company and Vickers manufactured about 200, a little more than 200 um, samples of his Pedersen rifle. Um, he was attempting to sell these to other customers, other militaries around the world, or frankly even sell them commercially. And unfortunately for him, it didn't really turn out well. Um, he failed to get any significant contracts for them, so only a couple hundred were ever made. Well, after that, by about 1932, um, when that endeavor hadn't really worked out, he took the idea to Japan. Uh, Japan was also interested in the gun, and so they actually made a number of their own copies to experiment with. Um, between 1932 and about 1935, they made both a carbine and a rifle version. Uh, best numbers we know of are probably about a dozen of each, so very few. Um, they experimented with them for a number of years. They were never able to quite get them running right. Um, the rumor, and I don't have any serious confirmation of this, but the rumor is they never quite realized that the cartridges had to be lubricated. Um, in the original Pedersen rifles, the cartridges used a hard wax coating that would allow them to extract under high pressure uh, successfully, because this is a delayed blowback action. Um, so it has fairly high extraction pressure. Well, reportedly, the Japanese never, never managed to get that system quite working, and so the, the guns never ran very reliably for them. And when their, their war against China really started picking up by 1936, they, they dropped this idea and stuck to the standard guns that they already had in production. So very unusual to find one of these, and I figured we should definitely take a look at it. So let me bring the camera back. We'll take a closer look at this one, and we'll also compare it to some elements of the British version of the Pedersen rifle, so you can see what carried over and what the Japanese changed. All right, so here we have the Japanese copy on top, the British one on the bottom. One of the very obvious differences you'll notice right off the bat is the difference in magazine. This particular Japanese gun has a rotary magazine, actually kind of like a Johnson rifle, while the original British Pedersen, uh, and also the American Trials version of the Pedersen, used an end block clip rather like the Garand. So the Japanese actually experimented with a couple different versions. They did uh, a number of different types of magazine, and this particular one has a rotary magazine. Another purely aesthetic difference, or primarily aesthetic difference we can see, is that on the British Pedersen, the barrel has this spiral fluting on it uh, to increase surface area and improve cooling. The Japanese just dispensed with that idea altogether, and they just have a plain round barrel. Probably makes a lot more sense. I doubt it was really worth the machining time to get that bit of extra surface area. Now these are both toggle lock actions, so let me put the camera down and let's take a closer look at the actions. All right, on our British gun here, we have a handle on the side. When you pull that up, it breaks the knee joint. Here is our follower, where you would put in, this would have been a 10 round clip in 276 Pedersen. When you put the clip in, it releases the bolt, which I can do manually by pushing down on the follower. There we go. And we have a cross bolt safety here. That's safe, and that's ready to fire. The Japanese gun uses the same mechanism, but it does have some detailed differences. For one thing, our safety is this switch on the side. That is safe, which prevents me from opening the bolt. That is fire. Pulling up on this, again, breaks the toggle, but the Japanese gun has this rotary magazine inside and does not lock open when the magazine is empty. However, I have this latch here 
is a bolt pulled open. So I can manually push this up and lock the bolt in its open position. Another interesting difference is that the Japanese gun is actually significantly easier to disassemble than the original Pedersen version. So there is a spring catch here on the back of the receiver and what this does is actually disconnect the mainspring. So there's a spring down inside the gun that puts pressure on this toggle lock. As I mentioned, this is a delayed blowback, so what happens when it fires is pressure on the front of this bolt acts on a series of precisely machined camming surfaces in these joints and forces the joint to break. Now it takes enough force to do this by pushing on the front of the bolt that by the time it pops open, pressure has dropped. The bullet has left the bore and the pressure in the chamber is down to a safe level to extract. So this doesn't have a recoil system, it doesn't have a gas system, it's just delayed blowback. Now obviously there's a spring powering this and I can use this button to disable the spring. So if I open this up and push in on the spring, you'll see this button now stays down and there's no spring tension on the bolt. Once I've disconnected the spring like that, I can use this cross pin right here. I push that down, pull it out, and now the whole toggle lock assembly lifts out. This thing is really quite complex on the underside. There's a ton of machining that goes into the Pedersen design. So obviously this will look a bit familiar to someone who's familiar with the Luger. Um, we have our firing pin right here in the front portion of the bolt assembly. It is spring loaded. There's the firing pin. And it's interesting that it's actually got its knurled surface on the back. The striker mechanism in the gun is this piece right here, which when the bolt's not in, it's uh, not fully functional. But what happens is effectively uh, when the bolt's in, this is under spring tension. And when I pull the trigger, it snaps forward like this. And this flat surface hits this knurled surface, which pokes the firing pin out. So that's how the gun actually fires. We have all of our machined surfaces in here that cause this to break under the right amount of pressure. Well, break as in the joint breaks, obviously. So the rest of the inside of the mechanism is taken up with this rotary magazine. It would hold 10 cartridges, and this rifle is chambered for 6.5 uh, Japanese. Interestingly, the rifle does also have this Japanese scope rail adapted to the side. Uh, clearly an experimental sort of thing. Uh, this will not fit a standard Japanese sniper rifle scope of the era off of, say, a Type 97 bolt action. Uh, it's very similar, but not quite identical. So I don't know exactly what scope they would have put on here, but this is something that was never, well, obviously the rifle was never adopted, and, and so the scope was not either. Um, this particular gun is serial number eight. There, it's numbered on the receiver. It is also numbered right here on the bottom of the stock. It's interesting to note that while they, the Japanese got rid of Pedersen's fluting, they did leave all of these vent holes on the bottom of the stock, which we can see here on the Vickers Pedersen rifle. And this one, we've got slots in the front, holes in the back, but the exact same idea. A few other Distinctively Japanese elements, the rear sling swivel is just like an Arasaka. The butt plate is very similar to an Arasaka. The rear tang is one solid piece, which is like a later Arasaka. There we go, very distinctive pot-bellied appearance to this gun. Um, it actually handles pretty well. It's interesting to note that the sights are slightly offset to the side. There you go, you can get a, a view of it there. And the sight adjustment is also rather similar to the British Pedersen. 
So I have this adjustment knob for windage. And I have this one. I push down on this button, which allows me to rotate this knurled knob, which raises and lowers the sight. And then we have markings on the back here to tell you what range you're set to. All right, let's go ahead and put the toggle mechanism back in the gun. This is a very simple process. Drop the back of the lock in. It's got a pair of cutouts in the rails at the back here of the receiver so that you can do that. Slide it forward. And by the way, this thing slides very smoothly. The machining in this gun is really well done. We drop the, the rear piece in, drop it down. Now it's lined up. I can put the cross pin in. That snaps in very nicely. It's kind of cool. I don't have to do anything special to re-engage the mainspring. All I have to do is rack the bolt and it will automatically engage. So now we're ready to go again. Well, thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I certainly enjoyed getting a chance to take a closer look at this Japanese copy of a Pedersen rifle. Uh, it is, of course, for sale here at Rock Island. This is an auction house. So if you'd like to add it to your own collection of interesting and unusual developmental semi-auto rifles, uh, you have the opportunity to do so. If you check the link right below in the description text, that will take you to Rock Island's catalog page on the gun. You can see uh, their catalogers description, you can see their high-res pictures, and uh, create an account online, place a bid yourself, or make some plans to come down here and attend the auction in person. Thanks for watching.